2020 has been nuts. How have things changed in the organization since the beginning of the year? I'd say things have only improved in 2020. That's not a bluff. You've seen like this run of panic purchases in our industry. Whatever was infirm in 2019, that went away. Everybody wants a ghost gunner now. Everybody seems to get it. The conversation just a few years ago with this machine is like, oh, I guess that makes sense to like, when can I get mine? Please let me jump ahead of the line, right? People suddenly understand the situation has changed. All right. So with the rate of ghost gunner sales skyrocketing, uh, how far do you, th how far away do you think we are from decentralized, distributed manufacturer firearms rivaling convention, conventional centers of manufacture, with like the 3D printed gun renaissance and obviously the G ghost gunner sales? The means are there for, let's say, like a veritable Lord of Paperweights, you know, like a <laughs> Nick Cage, Lord of War, arm the other 11. But do you think that the public has the will to make that a reality? It's a question of like, um, can you economize? Can you commercialize? If it's, you know, like let's say the regulatory burden jumps that much higher under a, a new Biden regime or something. Yeah, I, I think things will naturally even effortlessly shift into more 3D printing and more like, let's say, non-standard decentralized production. But right now, like, you know, from the, the time that we've had, the perspective that we've had for years of watching this space, I still think the, the processes people use are, you know, they're limited. They're limited physical processes. Um, it would be a long time to directly, and in the same terms of the commercial gun manufacturers, rival those same manufacturers, not just for their processes, which are much more efficient and developed, but, but simply because of the economies of scale and, uh, you know, the money involved from uh, centralized payers and nation states. So uh, if you're really just asking me how to forecast when this decentralized activity rivals the centralized activity, <clears throat> you're going to wait a while. So segueing from that, uh, how is how will Ghost Gunner as a business respond if unfinished firearm blanks or 80% lower is a marketing term are regulated away from legality? I mean, granted, DefCat and all the files on there will still be around forever. That's just the nature of the internet. But what would you do with the leftover hardware? What kind of support would you provide? So first, I'm not sure I accept the frame of the question. I don't think even if you're objectively trying to make what we're doing here illegal with like specific words in a bill that somehow still passes, that you can still even accomplish that. One, because you can divert uh, the process in the courts. Or two, you know they're always incomplete, especially when they try to get specific. You've seen these, these, unfin these unfinished firearms bills. They don't even know how to define what unfinished is, right? It becomes this all-encompassing, but also purposely vague. And um, one, there's constitutional doctrines which prevent this. But two, to quote, you know, or to at least um, cite Uncle Ted, um, even when you're trying to accomplish an objective, you can't in a democratically governed situation. So I, I'm looking at some of these bills and thinking they don't even do what the authors think they do. You understand? And they don't even care. Because here's the arch cynicism of this process. They can tell you, and if, as long as they can tell you on TV that they took care of it, they don't care about what we're doing anyway, right? Maybe they need to come back after me or something for points or something, but only when I get a little uppity, you know, and insist that it's in the news. When's, when's the last prosecution of, of anybody having files in this country, even though that's now objectively illegal in multiple states? Are there any plans on either expanding the ghost gunner or developing some new kind of machine to create other firearms parts apart from a frame or receiver completion? <sighs> Look, there's always plans, you know, like we put our finger to the wind and we try to predict where things will be in six months. And when we did that with Ghost Gunner 3 at the end of last year, uh, we were wrong about where things would be in a year. You know, one word now we're just trying to like uh, uh, just somehow accommodate all the demand just for what is, you know, the, the prototyping process has, has been developed in a few directions for just mainline applications we want to support like AK or variable frequency drive on the machine. We've seen the, the community itself develop around, let's say, 0% receivers, and they're expecting, you know, these types of, I don't know, interruptions to our activity. But, dude, I think the, the COVID days are so hot and heavy that it's not even a top five of a Democrat regime to even get good gun bills out. I just, uh, I can tell you where things are going to be, and I can tell you what our plans are, but even they don't anticipate how radically ironic and difficult the times are right now. I'm just trying to hold on like everybody else is. Maybe like if I wanted to be more positive, I'd say there's so many different people in the community building so many different things that, yeah, like I think we've got all the strategic bases covered uh, between us and the community. Will there ever be an affordable ghost gunner style machine oriented towards the maker community rather than specifically catered <laughs> for firearms enthusiasts? Yeah, of course. And I think, one, 
you could say we have some competitors who are already like targeting that market. They're not in our price, like, let's say our price category. But two, like, yeah, I, I believe that there will be these types of machines, especially if they make us go in that direction. Um, you could say like we market the Ghost Gunner based on the application, but it's still an open platform. And so really, I, I consider it both affordable and targeted to makers. It's just, uh, you know, if your moral hygiene prevents you from working with the gun machine, then maybe, you know, maybe you're not the type of maker that we want to target. And speaking of the maker community, I know a long while ago you had some words to say about Brie Pettis, but um, what's your take on the maker movement as it stands today? Uh, I didn't know that there really still was a maker movement. From what I've seen, most people kind of aged out and they became uh, young urban professionals or, you know, they just moved on to the next thing. There's, there's always tinkers, there's always like people on the internet, there's always people doing things with electronics, but, you know, it's like each generation has its little cultural moments and I don't know if the maker movement ever came to anything as it's, you know, as it defined itself, as it saw itself in its own terms. I don't feel a presence there. Um, and now COVID's happened. I mean, uh, brother, what I see now is more like the prominent makers in this space have become like, let's say, notable YouTubers or programmers or they get like work. And, and I don't know that this younger generation participates the same way. They have like a better sets of cynicism. They're not as, um, I don't know, neutral in their political affiliations. And I don't know. I don't see a maker movement like I did just four or five years ago. Yeah. And with the current climate of the pandemic, uh, and obviously panic buying and panic uh, just everything. What, what do you think of uh, the evolution of U.S. gun culture during these times going forward into 21, 22? Yeah. I think about this a lot, about the state of the culture and its evolution. You know, for me, a lot of stuff, it, it feels like a lot of stuff developed after the expiration of the assault weapons ban. And it was good that this happened, you know, approximate to the Obama administration. And then with the rise of YouTube, it was like those three things together, both created like a more intense focus on what could be done with ARs. And then like, a, you could say Web 2.0 really derived the culture that we're all participating in today. We're all watching each other. It's not just the budget AR stuff, it's it's customizability, you know, like the, the aspects of that gun, which are so unique to itself, also I think spelled the culture. Both like the budget producers who got kind of like wrecked when Trump came around, I don't know. I just felt like the, the culture for the first time got a, an ability to look at itself outside of forums with like YouTube and, and you know more enhanced social media. So now it's interesting to see YouTube and everybody like crack down and like really try to expel everything. And so it's a different, it's a more politically minded culture because this culture wants to exist, right? It doesn't want to be expelled. So now I've seen like a more direct affiliation with our line of thinking, if I can be so bold, that you really do have to be resolutely anti-state or cynical about politicians and not just cynical like in a, I don't know, an inactive way. Um, if you participate in our culture now, you participate because you have a view to undermining the ritual humiliations that these people want to visit on you. And you see it in those terms. You know they want to humiliate you. It takes something away from you. The culture seems to be, that, that seems to be part of the mainstream of this culture. So what's up next for Defense Distributed? Anything you can hint at for us to look forward to in the near future or anything showcase at the next trade show? Well, look, I can't help but be, you know, a little circumspect or a little close to, to the West with what we do. It's just fun. That way. Uh, but it also follows a symbolic strategy. Because the election's coming up the way it is and we don't know exactly what will happen, who will hold the Senate, you know, um, it's good to let them move first and then to have what I would call the second move advantage. Right, well, thank you for taking the time to answer these questions for us. It's Cody Wilson from Defense Distributed. It's my pleasure. Ooh, so that's a, that's a vintage Zaku 2 from Bandai. Perfect grade. Wow. And you know what's great about the box is uh, I'm pretty sure it has a logo for the Principality of Xeon. Uh, Principality of Xeon, mass product and mobile suit. This aesthetic is incredible. If we can have a package on a product like this, I'd do it in a heartbeat.